welcome to Wells Branch Community Church, and we are doing something called the Art of Neighboring. We're, we're joining over 300 other churches in Austin with this campaign to love where you live. So there, you know, there's, it's like double meaning, you ready? So you want to love where you live. Like, I love living in Wells Branch, the, the community park, the amenities, and uh, the schools, and the blah, blah, blah. And then also, I, for Christians specifically, I want to love the people where I live. All right, so that's sort of like been the heartbeat of what our church is all about. And so we're going to continue with this series. But there's, I can already sort of feel pushbacks like, Chris, didn't we do this already? I mean, like, do we really need to go? And, you know, we, like we did that series back in October and it's like one and done. Let's just keep this thing moving along. And the reality is we can't because this is what our church is truly all about. In fact, I don't know if you guys know this, um, our purpose statement is we are a family of believers committed to reaching people with a life-changing reality of Jesus Christ. And so that, that brings us really to what uh, the theme verse is uh, for this series. So for the next three weeks uh, leading up to Easter, uh, we're going to be looking at how we can love where we live. And the reason for that is this, uh, this verse that, uh, that Paul gives us from uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 19. It says, for what is our hope or joy or or crown of boasting before our Lord, Lord Jesus at his coming. Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Meaning, like you're our trophy. When it comes before God, we go like, God, you know, you know what, did, what did you do before me? What rewards are you looking for? It's like, look at these people I brought with me into your kingdom. These people are the ones that are excited about. You know, we, have, we understand trophy cases because we understand like winning. Like, I mean, we're a culture of winners around here and at least competitors, right? And so like, I want, I want to compete in just about everything I do. And the one thing that when we go before God, the only thing that's really going to matter is who in a sense we brought with us. So does, don't you kind of hate it when churches have an agenda? Well, I'm going to let you know on something. We have an agenda, all right? And so, but it's a good agenda, all right? We have a good agenda. We don't want something from you, all right? We want something for you. We want you to experience amazing community. In fact, one of the reasons why I love my job, like I just love my job, is because I get to hang out with you people all the time. It's like, this is, it's like my job to like, it's like rent a friend, I guess. I don't know. Like I get to be your friend. Like that's my job. I get to encourage you. I get to love you. I get to experience good times and bad times. It's like awesome that I get to do that with you. And it's not like, a, it doesn't feel like a job because it's like, the thing I'd be doing if nobody paid me anything. I love what I do. And so um, for me, it's really awesome. But I'll be honest with you, um, how awesome it is, it makes it hard for me because it is so awesome with all of our friends here for me to go and reach and talk to somebody that I don't know. All right. And so last October, I sort of pushed everybody and it was like, we need to go meet our neighbors. And I, and I went and met all my neighbors and uh, I even got phone numbers. And the way that I had to do it, because I just, going up to the door was just so weird. I just, I, I, so I would, okay, do you guys have the little side little window thing right next to your door? I already feel judgment coming on from over here. So my little window thing looks out at the mailbox, okay? So I can see where all the people come to get their mail, and it's like golden opportunity to go and meet people, right? Because like, it's, it looks like it's spontaneous, so I, I would wait, and I, you know, I had one of my neighbors, um, you know, they're a little older, different age and stage, and I was just like, how am I going to connect with him? I don't really know. And I said, okay, mailbox, that's something that's in common. Okay. <laughs> so every, every day I come home from work, and I just kind of sit there and go, all right, Austin, don't kill Jet. <laughs> and I just wait, you know, you know kind of like a sniper waiting in, in ambush, only we're not killing anybody. All right. So I'm waiting there, and I'm waiting there, and I'm waiting there, and then there he goes. There's my neighbor that I've been trying to connect with. He's going for the mailbox. I'm like, mission on. Uh, you know, I'm going out. I'm going, sort of, I flash back a little bit there, but all right, so I'm going in, in to meet my neighbor, right? And so I'm going to go and say, what's up? And I, like, I've got my, my line. It's like, hey, get in the mail. I almost feel like someone needs to give me a sign, right? right. So I go, I go and I interact with him. And uh, I'm like, hey, I'm your neighbor. You know, the one that lives across the street from me. And it, we wave at each other all the time. So it's not like I need to explain where we live, but I don't know what else to say. And then it comes like the, this is like, you know, remember in high school when you're going to ask a girl out to like the prom or something? You, didn't, you never really talked to her before, but you've seen each other. It was that moment. I'm like, 
So I was wondering if I could get like your number. Because it would be cool to have you come over or something. And he didn't, and like it was, I thought he'd be like, that's weird. And be like, no, move on. But he didn't. He like gave me his number. I was like, wow, that was really easy. And then I go walk, and it was like, I did a little victory dance, and I got his number, and I got, you know, it was awesome. And so then I wrote him on my little chart of people I'd be praying for. In fact, um, let me put up that little chart. It was this guy right here in the upper uh, right-hand corner. Uh, his name is VJ, and his wife is Anju. So I even got, I even had the boldness to go like, what's your wife's name? And he's like, Anju. And I'm like, can you spell it? <laughs> and so anyway, I got VJ's number, and then I was going to text him. But I got two kids, and they don't sleep a lot. Well, they do, and then sometimes they don't, and they throw up, and they get sick, and they do kid things, like throw temper tantrums, and sore, sometimes embarrass and invite people over because, you know, you want your kids to behave, you want to put up the best example, all those kind of things. And so, and then it was October, and there was Halloween, we saw them at Halloween, we let you know, hey, hey, you know, awesome costumes. And then November comes around, and what's November? Thanksgiving. And can you really do anything during Thanksgiving? No, you can't, because you've got things going on. So that wasn't a good time. And then December comes around, and you know what happens in December? Christmas parties. And like, we got a lot of parties to go to, because we have a lot of awesome friends, and you know, like, like I really want to meet them, but not only would it be awkward to invite them, I don't know what I talk about, and I got a lot of parties with friends I do know, okay? So that's not a good time. And plus, I have kids, so that, you know, like, just can't. And then January, and that's New Year's, right? And that's playoff time for football. And do we really have time for anything else? No. And so, you know, like I've got to be parenting and I've got, like, I'm busy. And then February comes around and then we had a men's retreat and Valentine's Day. And then, you know, other, you know, in church world, you have multiple retreats. And so I had another retreat and I've got kids and they would sometimes get sick and, you know, that's hard. And so that wasn't a good time. And finally it came back to March and I was like, oh no, I'm preaching a sermon on this. And if I don't like, you know, like, invite somebody over and be like the biggest hypocrite of all time. So I was like, okay, Adrian, it was like, it was, it was actually this Monday. <laughs> and I was like, uh, hey, Adrian, um, so can we invite some people over for dinner on Friday? And she's like, well, who do you want to invite? I said, well, we, our neighbors that we've been praying for, uh, we haven't had them over to dinner in like, you know, ever. And so, um, I think it's time and, you know, uh, Austin was, he got some sort of weird stomach flu and like jet, you know, he just wants to not sleep at night. And so um, she was like, this really isn't a good time. I said, I know, there's never a good time. And she's like, well, when are you going to invite? I said, for Friday. And it was Monday. She's like, oh, there's no way they'll say yes. So go ahead and invite them. They'll just say no and we'll be off the hook. I was like, all right. (laughs) I said, good point. But listen, here's the thing. I'll bet you, I'll bet you that they don't say no. And so I I, I texted, uh, VJ, and the reason why I thought that is because everybody on the planet, here's the thing, let me put it this way, Christians who experience authentic community, we get involved in that after a while, we don't realize how awesome it is. Like there are people who don't have Christian community. There are people like that when somebody gets sick in the family or there are people when like you lose a job, they have no one to talk to, no one to turn to. When, uh, when they're like, who do I call about? What medicine should I be using? Or, you know, my, you know to talk about the real issues of life, they don't have anywhere to go. They just don't. And so there's a, a real sort of sense of joy and satisfaction that I have with our friends here. But the reality is if we get, content with creating our own Christian clique, what we've done is become the very thing that a lot of us didn't like about churches, how clicky it was. And so the very thing that made you not like churches, the very thing that we become over time because of how awesome Christian community is. And so, so I was like, let's invite him. So I invite him. And then the very next day, he texts back. He's like, oh yes, we would love to. What can we bring? And I text Adrian back. It's like, what can they bring? <laughs> And then my next thought was like, what am I going to say? So I text the Saucedas, they're my next door neighbors to my right, and they're great talkers. I said, hey, you guys got to come over too because I don't know what to say. So I, you know, I need some help because I'm not really great at, at, you know, talking to people I don't know. So help me out. So I invited the Saucedas and so it would be the six of us. And they said, yes. And they made time in their calendar for a Friday. Why would they do that? 
Because isn't it true, isn't it true, that if you're outside this thing of Christian community, there's a part of you that's lonely. In fact, if you live in an apartment and you don't go to church, you are not only, you are one of the loneliest people on the planet, and that's why we, one of the things that we try to be super intentional about is reaching people in apartments. But people in houses have the same issue. They're hoping that someone is bold enough to come knock on the door and say, hey, I live across the street. I want to get to know you. There's a deep, deep, deep need for that. And so this morning, um, I, want us to, I want to convince you that not only do we need to, um, uh, we have an agenda for people, but it's that we want something for them. We want them to experience the same sort of amazing community that we have and we've experienced and that the amazing community that we can have with God, ultimately. So that's where we're going. We're going to be in uh, 1 Thessalonians. So if you don't have a Bible, raise your hand in the air, wave it like you do care, and you're probably like, where is 1 Thessalonians? All right, so 1 Thessalonians, it's in the New Testament. So if you know where the New Testament is, that's like Matthew. So you know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, then Ark, General Electric Power Company, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Ark, General Electric Power Company, First Thessalonians. Okay, that's where it is. Or you can just go to page 986 and the Bible's been passed out or pull out your iPhone. You probably have to do no thinking to find it there. Okay, that's where we're going. And, and, we're, and Paul, who, who is the author of this letter, <clears throat> is a church planner. And he's writing to a church that he just planted. And uh, on his second missionary journey, he's writing from Corinth, the city we just talked about last week and all their issues with love. And uh, he's going to be writing to this church in Thessalonica. All right, that's where we're going. And we're going to find out what he's going to be writing about and sort of like this one issue of the art of neighboring and loving people where you live becomes paramount. Here we go. Paul, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, Silvanus. Now, Silvanus is just another word for Silas. It's like the long version. It's like si- Silas is so- short for Silvanus. So the guy that went on the mission trip with him. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. Timothy is one of Paul's like protégés. He's a pastor. He's raised up. He's a stud, and he's with him when he's writing this letter. To the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Now, first off, I want to give a quick, quick explanation of how this church was planted. Uh, there was a, a church in, a, a church was planted in Philippi after uh, Paul got arrested. Remember, and he and Silas are in jail, and they're, they're rocking out to praise songs, you know, and then the earthquake happens. They lead the Philippian jailer to Christ. And a bunch of other people come to know Jesus. And then they leave there. And then uh, Acts 17, I'm going to put it up here on the screen for you. Acts 17 tells us what happened. Now, when they had pa- left Philippi and they passed through Amphipolis, Amphipolis, that's a fun word to say three times fast, Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. And there was a synagogue of the Jews. So they go through Amphipolis and they go through Apollonia and they don't stop for some reason. I don't know why they don't stop, but they don't stop. And that's going to become important in a second. And they do come to Thessalonica and that's where they they hang out and they go to the synagogue. And Paul went in, as was his custom, custom, on three Sabbath days, so essentially for three weeks in a row on three consecutive Saturdays, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. So that's what Paul would do. He would come into a, a city, he would find the local synagogue, a place where he was sort of comfortable, and then he would meet people and he would preach to them. But then he would live with them like as a tent maker or just live with them as a missionary who, who had, had funds to live with from other churches, and he would live there among them. Uh, back to 1 Thessalonians um, 1. So we give thanks to God, verse 2, we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your, there's three things, your work of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope. Now, when I first read this, I was like, work of faith? How do, like, you don't have to work for faith. Did you guys know that? I don't know if you guys knew that. Like, faith is a gift that God gives you. It's not something you can churn up or earn it or like, I'm going to be really good. I'm going to try really, I'm going to believe. It's something that, so for some of you who are like, I want to believe Chris, but I just can't. Good news, you can't like conjure that up within you. It's a gift of God that he puts in your heart and it explodes out of that. And so, but here's the reality. It it is work sometimes to be a believer, to be somebody who believes that Jesus died on the cross for our sins as an actual person, an actual God-man came and died on the cross for our sins for all the things that you've done bad, for all the stuff that you deserve wrong, and then he rose from the dead. That's, you can't believe that unless God gives you the ability to believe that. Because sometimes you can take an intellectual assent to it, but 
That's not true trust and faith of my whole life and being is on Jesus. But it is difficult, especially in a culture that doesn't believe in Jesus, to believe in Jesus. That's a work of faith. Like just simply existing, it's, it's exhausting. God gives you the power to do it. And then a labor of love, I mean, what does that mean? Well, to love some people is kind of takes a lot of labor. You, you, you know, the EGR, extra grace required. You have a lot of people that, that surround you that are a little, they take a little extra love. And, and let's just be honest, some of you might be married to that person or you might be the one that's married to and you take extra labor to love. And so that's just what the re- reality is with people that sometimes we can be a little obtuse, sometimes we can be a little bit difficult to love and it's a real labor to love us. And that's, he's saying, good job on loving people well, it's hard and steadfastness of hope. Like they did not quit on believing that one day this job and this, the, work, the work environment they're at that was sometimes abusive wouldn't be all that there is. That one day Jesus was coming back and he was their hope. Your work of faith, labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Now that's a weird phrase. And sometimes people get nervous when I say, Did you know that God chose you? No, no, I chose God. Okay, it says right here that God chose, maybe maybe you chose God, but he chose the Thessalonians or the Thessalonians who live in Thessalonica for some reason. And so the way that it works is this, because it sure feels like we choose God, doesn't it? Here's the way it works. I'm going to try my best to explain to you predestination. Here's your theology class, one-on-one you're always waiting for, and one of my favorite classes in there. Here it is. So God sets in motion uh, that Paul and Silas and Timothy and his whole band of merry men would show up in Thessalonica and they're just having another day. They're going to get their coffee, they're driving to work uh, or cameling to work or whatever they do. And uh, And then all of a sudden this dude shows up and he's preaching about Jesus whom they had never heard of and he's like, well, that makes sense. See, God shows them. But if Paul and Silas don't go, they don't come to know Jesus because there's no multiverse. There's no like alternate universe where they did come to know Christ. No, there's just one and God created. He knew how it was going to go from the beginning of time. And then Paul and Silas, when they show up on the scene, he is going to share Jesus with them. And if they don't, then they won't know him until he does. Which let's just put it in our parlance today. It's this, your neighbors aren't going to know Jesus until you go across the street and share it with them. But here's the cool part. God chose you to share the, the gospel with them and the ones who he's going to share the gospel with through you, it's through you. And so here's the good news for that. I get, as a pastor, I get this like every day, so it's kind of great. I get to sit like front row, like slammed up against the windshield to watch God stuff happening every day in people's lives. And there's nothing more encouraging than watching God show up in somebody's life, okay? That's, that's why it's important to understand that God chose you. So it takes the burden off of you to understand, like, if they don't get saved, they don't come to know Jesus, it's my fault. That's, that's, that's very freeing. Your responsibility is to carry the message. It's God's responsibility for them to get it. All right. It's God, the God, he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. All right, so I, let me explain what, what I mean by that. It's best probably to show it through whatever actually happened in, with the Thessalonians. So, Back to Acts 17, and Paul went in, and as was his custom, on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scripture. So about a month worth of reasoning with them and then living among them, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer for your sins, for my sins, for the sins of the world, and to rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few, in other words, a lot, of the leading women. Okay, so let me break that down. God chose the Thessalonian neighborhood to experience the gospel in word, power, and the Holy Spirit, and Holy Spirit conviction. So if you didn't know it, the gospel has words to it. And I just explained it. It's that we are sinners, born sinners. And the consequence of our sin is hell. Like this, eh, man, that's really weird to say, right? Because we're in a politically correct world. We don't like talking about hell. You know, people don't like to hear about it. But being politically incorrect really helps you in the political world. So I guess maybe we can kind of bring it to this world as well. Um, all right, but here it is. 
it's this, that you are a sinner. Like we're sinners. Like if you've never done anything wrong against your own conscience, you're lying. And then therefore you have. All right, so here it is. The consequence of sin is death, like eternal death, like separation from God. And it's not that necessarily that it's like flames and fire and stuff, but it's that you are separated from God and there is this absolute loneliness that strikes the core of you. So it's like you're, you will exist beyond this life. Your soul lives beyond your body. You guys know that, right? You're a soul with a body, not a body with a soul. You guys know that. And so because that, you will experience either ultimate love or ultimate pain because your sorrow and loneliness has created a separation from God. So Jesus, here's the gospel message in words. Jesus was sent by God to die on the cross for our sins. And he rose from the dead. And anyone who receives it won't perish, but have eternal life. There's a bunch of words for you to experience, okay? Now, that's the gospel in word, but there's power to it. You see, if you just have an intellectual sense, there's no power to that. But for some of us, we've heard those words and somehow it has transcended space and time that we somehow connect us 21st century people to a around the turn of the beginning of you know, BC to AD or BCE to CE. All of a sudden there's a connection with that that somehow metaphysically forgives me of my sins. That's power. That's real power. And that's what we all unite around when we talk about what happened to us when we got saved. We start crying about it. Why? We don't even know. Because somehow we got connected to this Jesus who was the God man who died on the cross for our sins, rose from the dead. All right. And then finally, we're going to experience Holy Spirit conviction, which is really helpful so that your wife doesn't have to be the Holy Spirit or husband. Isn't that helpful? All right. So we're going to keep moving. And so here's how I wanted to show how that sort of played itself out in real life. So um, we have a couple here that go to our church. Uh, it's David and Grace Prindle. We love David and Grace. They were here at first service. They're awesome. And uh, they do something called apartment life. So one of the things that we do uh, at our church is we invest in couples to go invest in their apartment community. So that means they like work for the apartment community and then we help fund that. And so they put on fun events like, hey, it's like omelet at 11.30 or brunch or whatever they put on and like get the strawberries and cookies and we're going to have fun meeting people. And at apartment complexes where 91% of people are unchurched and where most of them are going, I'm lonely out of my mind. I will come to whatever it is. I don't even care what it is. I'm there. And so we put on events every month, uh, sometimes twice, sometimes four times a month for people to come and just meet one another and Dave and Grace Brindle are part of that team. Now, one day at one of these awesome events, up comes young, uh, one of their neighbors, his name is Zach. And Zach's like, hey, everybody. <laughs> and Zach is from Utah. And he just moved into town. He's like, hey, I, you know, what's going on? And she's like, well, Dave and Grace share that, you know, we go to Wells Branch Community Church. It's really awesome. Let me know if you'd be interested in going. That. Oh, it's like, I'd sort of be interested in that. And so he, they sort of text, but he never, doesn't go right, right away. But he becomes friends with David and Grace, friends enough that when Grace has a birthday party, David's like, yo, Zach, you should come to the birthday party. It's not at our place. We're going to go uh, to our buddy James's place, and we're going to have our party at his house. <laughs> and so they go to James, who's throwing the birthday party for Grace, and James is just a little bit intense of a person. I don't know if you can pick that up from meeting James. We love James. Uh, J James, where are you at? James is right here. Okay, so that's James. And so James has like a scavenger hunt birthday party. Like I said, it was, it was intense. And like you go around like taking pictures of stuff. And so somehow Zach gets paired up with James and they go around Austin taking pictures of things for a scavenger hunt. And during that time, they get to know each other. And then there's that moment where um, after the scavenger hunt, the birthday party's over, James is like, hey, you wanna, you wanna hang out? Only a lot less creepily, Okay. <laughs> And, uh, and so Zach's like, sure. And so they start to have a conversation. And so then James does what, what we should do is ask him about them. He's like, I got, want something for you. But first, before I give, tell you about the amazing hope that we have, tell me about you. And he says, well, I, I grew up in Utah and I'm really tired of everybody, you know, Mormon people trying to force religion down my throat. And then James goes, oh, so do you, do you think you're going to go to heaven? He's like, well, I'm like 98% sure. I mean, I, I'm pretty much a good person. I mean, because, you know, I'm pretty good. And, uh, but I just, you know, I need to do a little bit more. And, and then James goes, oh, that's cool. And he just kind of lets it linger and wait. Because when you ask somebody what they believe, what's the natural thing that they're going to do to kind of keep a conversation going? 
so what do you believe, you know? And so it's like, oh, good thing you asked. Well, I don't believe there's anything you can do to get to heaven, but that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and he rose from the dead. That's how you come to a relationship with Jesus. And at that moment, Zach was like, huh, yeah. But out loud, he just goes, cool. And then he just kind of drops it. But in that moment, he hears from God and his whole soul has been transformed and he starts coming to church. He's like, man, I want more of that. Whatever that was, there was power there. And then he's living with his girlfriend at the time and, he, and all, of, all of a sudden the relationship doesn't feel right because somehow he's getting convicted of sin, like, you know, sex outside of marriage, that whole thing. And eventually, four months later, he's like, I can't live with you anymore because it's not right. And she moves out. And then, in fact, over time, he and David and James spend time, and he's like, I want to profess my relationship with Jesus, and he gets baptized. And there's an incredible experience where we celebrated it right here, like, ah! And it's not like he just, you know, he got saved, and he just kind of went about, about his life. It's just something started spurring in his heart as the Holy Spirit started convicting him more and more and more, like, this is what God, I've made you for. You need to experience that. And so he, he, he was like one of the singer kids in, like, in the choir, and he's like, hey, I'd like to lead worship. I don't know how to play guitar, but can somebody teach me? So he learns how to play guitar. And now he leads worship on Tuesday nights for the well. In fact, as one of our leaders, and in the picture we put up here, where Zach's leading worship at a, a leader retreat for all of our young adult leaders. And so here's how the gospel works, is that somebody gets infused with, they're transformed by it, the Holy Spirit convicts them, and the, they experience the power, not only of the words, but of the Holy Spirit doing a work in their life. And so that's sort of like what happens here at Wells Branch Community Church. If you're like, oh, we want something for Zach, something better. All right, verse five, back to First Thessalonians. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. So what was going on here is that, remember, there would be a preaching on Saturday in the Jewish synagogue. And then the rest of that week, Paul be hanging out with people. What's going on? Tell me about your life. Oh, really? Let me tell you about Jesus again. Oh, hey, what's going on? And he was a great neighbor. In fact, th that's my point. The Thessalonians eventually imitated their neighbor Paul's consistent way of life. In fact, the way he believed. But he had to live. Among and listen, this didn't take years. This took three weeks. And so I, I was sitting here. Like, How can I explain that, that that would really happen in our day to day? And I, I found a story that actually happened in three weeks. So um, where I live in the neighborhood, um, remember, I have a, a neighbor, and his name is uh, Joey, all right? And so Joey, if you were to find out where he lives, it's like, it's like right up there. Yeah, that's where uh, he lives. It's like the house behind the house. And I, I'd play uh, football with his younger brother, Jeremy, who's right here. And so Jeremy and I would play football, and every now and then I'd, I'd go by Jeremy's house, and I'd meet his dad. And, um, I, you know, my plan was to invite him to watch football because I knew that, you know, his dad liked football. But then I'd go into his house, and, like, their entire living room is a TV screen. And I'd go, hey, do you want to come watch football at my house? Wow, that's a big screen. Is your screen bigger than that? No. No, it's not. Okay. And so, and I was like, I got nothing. All right. So I would just go around and pray uh, for their family. And so we'd, you know, we'd prayer walk. We'd be like, God, please do something. Reach, reach my neighbors. And so um, Joey, uh, he, if you didn't know this, uh, he was like the local drug lord at uh, Round Rock High School. And so he would be dealing dope, making money, and have, he'd roll with like, you know, wads of cash. And so uh, one day he gets told, nah, we don't really want you at Round Rock High School. Go to another school. So they send him to McNeil. And so he, he comes over to McNeil. He starts, you know, hanging out with this girl. And, you know, they're sort of dating. And, uh, and then this girl says, hey, let's, let's invite um, one of my other friends who's kind of cool. His name's Jonas. He's going to come watch the football game. So... So Jonas goes to the football game. They start hanging out. And Joey really likes Jonas at first because he's like, oh, this must be the local drug dealer of McNeil. I'm going to get along with him. <laughs> and so Jonas starts, you know, hanging out. And he says, hey, listen, there's this thing that I go to um, after school uh, during the week. You should come. It's like an after school program. And they have food there. So, you know, so Joey and Jonas, they start hanging out. And then uh, Phil, one of our pastors here, would hold a Bible study uh, on Thursday nights, and, and Joey would come to that. And of course, Jonas said, hey, there's more food if you come to this other thing. And he kind of leaves out the Bible part, and so he's like, and open up your Bibles. And he's like, you know, and so he's, he's there reading the Bible along. And so after that, after a couple, couple of weeks of that, uh, Jonas looks over at Joey, and he's like, hey, so 
you know, where are you at with the whole Jesus thing? I mean, you keep coming to everything, and like you've, you've been coming to the after school program, and we hang out, and you hear about the Jesus deal. What, what you do? He's like, well, I grew up Catholic, so I understand, like, you know, Jesus dying on the cross. I mean, I've seen crucifixes my whole life. Um, you know, that's it. And so, and so then Jonah's like, it's, that's not quite, it's not just a story. It, it's something that interacts with my human condition. And he explains, I'm a sinner. And Jesus came. And he died on the cross for me. And this is a 15-year-old kid. He may look 35, but he's 15. <laughs> that Jesus died on the cross for my sin, and he rose from the dead, and that's where my hope lies. And it's not just an intellectual ascent. It's, just, it's more than that. And then Joey looks at him, and this just kind of riveted me. He says, is that why you're happy all the time? And Jonah's response goes, yeah, kind of, I guess, yeah. And Joey says, I want that. I want it is, whatever it is that makes you have joy, I want it. He, the, the cry of his soul, he didn't even know what exactly it was, but he, he looked at Jonas, he saw hope. He didn't see like, because there's, you know, there's all these things of coping, there's all these things of coping with the way things are at home, the way I've kind of lived my life. I've got all this shame, I've got all this pain, I've got all this hurt. Somebody talk to me, what is it? And it came in word, he experienced in power, and then Joey got saved and gave his life to Christ so that, so that, he, even now that he will be in front of the, our youth group sharing the gospel, sharing the hope of the world, transforming the lives of the kids in there so much so that Jeremy, the kid I've been playing football with, ran into a little bit of legal trouble. And then Joey goes to his parents and said, hey, you saw what happened to me. Send Jeremy to a little mission trip in Austin, and I want you to watch what God will do. So that his younger brother came to faith in Christ, and he's sitting right here. You see, that's how God works, and that's how the, the power of the gospel is real. Listen, we're here to reach our neighbors. God put you where you're at to reach them. Okay, we're gonna, a couple more verses, and we'll be done. We'll be done. Verse 6, back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in... Okay, and, and it's like, what happened? What do you mean in much affliction? Well, let me go back to Acts 17 for a second, uh, verse 5, and explains what happened. So Paul preaches the gospel and stuff goes weird. In fact, people get angry. The Jews got jealous and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob because that's what you do. They set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, one of the dudes that was hosting him, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, like they must have had some great hiding places, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also and Jason has received them. And they are all against the decrees of Caesar saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as a security from Jason, in other words, a bribe, and the rest, they let them go. <laughs> what a weird deal. So what happens? This church is birthed out of affliction. And so Jason hangs out. Not only is he like not deterred by the crowd, he's willing to take a beating for it because something is so powerful. Listen, listen. If there's something so powerful that you learned about three weeks ago, you're willing to take an a crowd beating for, that's powerful. But they were so transformed from the inside out, they couldn't go back. And if you're not a Christian, that doesn't make any sense. It's like once you experience the truth, once you take the pill, it's like the matrix. You know, once you kind of open up the whole other world, you can't deny that world exists anymore. And what happened to these people, they experienced the joy of Jesus. So that's all that their hope laid upon. All right, back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, that's like North Greece, Southern Greece, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything for they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you. Like they had to be received. In three weeks, they had, the, this story had to be shared and received and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And I want to pause right there because... I don't know, for many of you guys, you know, how many idols are you kind of, do you have set up in your house? Like, do you have a little Buddha statue you kind of give a little rub, rub the belly or something? I mean, it's possible. It's possible. That could be an idol you're dealing with. But you know what the idol we deal with 
materialism. You know what the idol we deal with? Um, comfort. Like we live in the world of uh, Netflix. We live in the world of video games where we want to go to somewhere where we get to be, hero, be the hero, but don't have to, there's, no, there's no payment. There's no, there's no responsibility for the way we live our life because we just get to start all over or we get to go to the next episode. That's the idol that we experience. But here's what's weird. Here's what's weird. Like when I first, on first read, I was like, man, I wonder what gods the, these Thessalonic and, or Thessalonians were worshiping. And I went back and read the story. Remember, they said it was the, the Greeks, the, the God-fearing Greeks and the Jews who already worshiped Yahweh, the God of the Bible. And so they were experiencing the same sort of idolatry of, of anything other than Jesus that satisfies your soul, anything other than God that satisfies your soul, that's an idol. All right, just in case you didn't realize that. And how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. This is why Easter in a couple weeks becomes so huge because all of our faith simply lays on that one historical fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. You can disprove the resurrection, then we'll all go home. Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. Jesus, remember heaven and hell? We don't like talking about hell because it's awkward, but we are on a projectile path towards hell. And Jesus comes to save us from that. He comes to save us from the wrath to come. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might be the righteousness of God. And whose wrath is he saving us from? God's wrath, which is kind of weird. Jesus, who is God, saves us from the wrath that he is sending. The, the wrath that he used to kind of dispense on the world, he now receives to save us and no longer, to let us no longer be separated from him. It's kind of powerful. So here it is. The Thessalonian neighbors were saved from serving idols to worship the living God. Saved from idols, worship the living God. And so here, again, I'm going to try and put this into our real world life. Um, I have another couple I want you guys to meet. It's uh, Kendall and Ben. And so Kendall and Ben, they live in an apartment nearby. And, you know, sometimes they're like, okay, it's only for, you know, young people. Like, you know, they're, they're, they're still, they're, their minds are open to new things, you know, that maybe, but what about older people? I mean, come on, let's make, be real about this. That's just for young people who can have their minds changed. So here's Kendall and, and Ben, and they got convicted by this back in October, and like, we need to really start praying for our neighbors. And so that's sort of convicting to me, but anyway, it's another story, another sermon, another time. And so they, so Kendall starts praying for neighbors, like, God, give me an opportunity to share the hope that I have with somebody at my apartment complex. And so as she's walking one day, she, she sees a lady, and she's like, you know what, I'm going to talk to this lady. Hi, I'm Kendall. And all of a sudden, a, a conversation starts, and it turns out this sweet lady, Twyla, had been waiting for somebody to connect with her. And she had had a hard life. Life hadn't gone the way she planned. Uh, back in 94, her husband died. And like, it's feel like hardship after hardship after struggle after struggle. And she just kind of moved to the area roughly uh, in the past year or so. And she's just like, I've never had a conversation with anybody here. And so Kendall doesn't go like, hey, nice to meet you. See you later. <laughs> Why don't you come to dinner? And so she invites Twyla to dinner before she invites her to church. In fact, she keeps inviting her to dinner and Twyla keeps coming because she's wanted there she's loved there because people want more than anything is for somebody to want to be with them and then on uh our our men went on a men's retreat and so galentine's day came around which i didn't even know was a thing uh and all the <laughs> all the women got together for the church they kind of had like a little galentine's day brunch again i don't really pretend to understand that and, uh, and so Twyla came, and she's like, wow, I really enjoyed that. I want to keep coming back. Can I come to church with you? And it turns out, like, you know, there had been a period, point in her life where she'd given herself to God, but life was hard. And so Twyla's actually here. And so and Twyla is here this morning. And in fact, after that Valentine's Day brunch, uh, the fun thing was, was Kendall and Twyla went ice skating. How cool is that? And that was something that Twyla had loved to do earlier in her life, but hadn't done in a long time. So they went ice skating. She's coming to our church. I'm not, listen, I'm not, you're not going to see, like, Twyla doesn't have the story, like, I'm all fixed. I'm perfect now. She's just like you, and she's just like me, and she's allowing God to transform her heart from the darkness to the light, to stop serving idols such as alcohol, to start serving the one true God. And she doesn't have it perfect, but she's here. She's saying, God, use me and change me from the inside out so that I can share the hope that I have with somebody else. 
So my, my question here this morning is, have you turned to God from serving idols? Have you turned from serving idols to the living God? And, and that first question, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose from the dead? That's the first question. Because here's the fun thing. So my, my neighbors came over on Friday, all right? So here's a quick picture of my neighbors coming over. There's Paul, like, hey. And um, it was awesome. And they shared with me that they actually believe that everything is a God. Like trees are gods, cows are gods, everything's a God. Brahma's a God, Brahma's their main God. And he's kind of like, in all, he's like very pantheistic. Everything's a God. And my hope in my heart, because I want something for them, is that they would come to know the true God. But them coming to know the true God, like my friendship with them, my love for them isn't dependent upon them knowing the true God. My hope is that they would know the one true God because of my love for them and they get experience what real community is. And so now, you know what's transferred because we had a, a I mean, it was like a two and a half hour dinner. Like we talked all night. I shared the hope of the gospel, told people, you know, heaven and hell. And they're like, cool. Here's what we believe. Everything's God. We basically believe all the same thing. And I'm kind of like, ah, not really. Can we do this again? I want to do this again. In fact, this Saturday, it's uh, my neighbor Paul's birthday, and they're coming over for the birthday party. And that's another touch. It's another, hey, let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me, let me look at my life. Look at the hope I have. Look at the joy that I have. I don't live my life kind of in the stress and the struggle of trying to have it all figured out because I'm okay with not having it figured out because God is okay. I'm fine because he says, you're mine. That's why I'm fine. And I need that. That's my hope. That's all I got. And so um, this morning, I want you to take out your little bulletin thingy. Can you guys guys pull those up, bulletin things? Things you got handed. Like when you came in. Yeah, raise it up. Raise it in the air. Hold it in the air. Wave like you care because I want everyone to see it. Those things. And I want you to draw a tic-tac-toe board on it. And then I want you to, like, you're in the middle. And then I want you to invite one of your neighbors. And if you're in an apartment, just figure it out how that works. Like, you could take a neighbor above, neighbor to the side, whatever. If you're in a house and you're like, is there somebody two down, or houses down you want to talk to? That's fine. But I want you to circle one of those people and say, I'm going to invite them to dinner this week. And then I want you to write the name of that person on the little prayer card thingy and then put it in the giving box in the back. And we're going to pray over those names together as a church tomorrow night, 730 at the Live for More Center. We're going to be praying for people who are our neighbors that when we invite them, that they not only say yes, that they come and we start a bond of friendship and love and community that ultimately one day we can say, hey, let me tell you about my Jesus. Would you like to receive it with power and full conviction of the Holy Spirit? And they would go, I want that. Tomorrow night, 7.30, we're praying for that. Circle one. Write their name. Put it in the giving box. Would you guys pray with me? Father, my prayer here is for two people. The person that's never given their life to you. Lord, I pray that you would convict them in power. God, that you, they've heard today the message that Jesus came. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. And Lord, that you would attach power to those words to penetrate a heart that they might say, I need that God. I'll do whatever I can for him. I just, I need that relationship with my Father, my Heavenly Father. And Father, I'm praying for those of us who have received that. And God, that we, are bu- we have busy schedules and busy lives. That, but this week, we'd say, I'm going to spend time with my neighbor this week. I'd invite them to dinner even before I invited them to church so that we could get to know them. And they would trust us. And then I would have something for them. Eternal life, a relationship with Jesus, an incredible community of believers committed to reaching people with a life change around Jesus. God, I need that so desperately for our church. God, I'm praying that you would infuse us with the ability to do the hard thing, to step out of our comfort zone, to put down an idol of comfort and unsocial awkwardness. And we'd step into the awkward. We'd step into the socially painful so that something spiritual could happen and people would come to life and life eternal. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This morning, in over both services, over 300 people here. And that means, probably in a crowd this size, one of our neighbors is lonely. 
One of our neighbors is really depressed. One of our neighbors is like, if somebody doesn't come and talk to me, I'm done. But what if this church went and loved where we live? What if we went to our next door neighbor, the one that God placed us at? God assigned the place where you live for the purpose of his purposes, and that's to reach them with a life changing around Jesus. What if you went across the street next door and you were the very thing, you were the very answer to somebody's prayer, God, help me. That could change the world. Would you receive the benediction? Go and be the answer to somebody's prayer. God, help me. Go and just push back on the darkness of depression, the darkness of anger and divorce and broken homes because the light of Jesus is coming next door. Go and push it back. Go and give hope and have an awesome week of worship. Here's Smith.